Uh, so yeah, I'm Richard. I'm a senior data infrastructure at Bramwatch. And yeah, this is what I'm talking to you about. Uh, so starting off with the agenda, I'm going to quickly go over how we use Solar at Brownwatch currently, the handshake between a company decision and a new project, and then our planning and design around this project, and then what we ended up making, then all of the testing we've done throughout this project, and then ending with our findings and hopefully some Q&A. Um, a bit about what Brownwatch is. So we're a world leader in social listening and consumer research. Um, we track billions of conversations every day, and this helps brands and agencies understand what people are saying about them online. I feel like I have to do a PSA after today's keynote that we're not like Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> we're completely moral. <laughs> um, I just want to put that out there. Um, but how we use Solar at Brownwatch. So um, I thought I'd do a quick raise of hands of who uses Solar in production at the moment. Okay. I know those lot do, they work for me. Um, but keep your hand up if you have, say, 10 million or more documents. Okay, and then hundreds of millions, billions. Okay, cool. We've got a wide range of people. Uh, but to quickly recap on the solar card structure for those who don't use it, um, this is quite a basic diagram, but you effectively have your zookeeper, which can houses like the core state of your um, cluster, which it collects from solar nodes and collections. Uh, and then on the right-hand side here, uh, for every collection that's broken up into many, many shards, which is configurable by you. And then on the left-hand side, you have your solar nodes, which are basically just instances of solar running. And then these will house what are called replicas, which are essentially just a copy of the shard data in that collection. But at Brownwatch, we have two main data sets, what we call mentions and what we call quick search. So mentions, uh, the documents come from many different data sources online. Uh, they're tailored to uh, the client's query, and so we get a constant stream of updates and deletes with them. And our mentions clusters serve anywhere between 4 and 13 billion. And we typically run this on a cluster of 96 instances spread over 16 machines. And we currently have 27 in production. And then for quick search, it just the data comes from the Twitter firehose. It's a lot more static, uh, so the only thing that changes the data is the compliance that we do, because we're not at Cambridge Analytica, and that will delete stuff. <laughs> and then the document ranges from 2 billion to 26 billion, and this, again, is either uh, 96 or 192 instances, and we've got four of those. But as for Solar, we use the same version across the board, which is 773. Um, especially at this scale, it can be quite hard to upgrade, because you've got to re-index, etc. Uh, we use Puppet to manage everything because we house everything in data centers and we have our own plugins that are just specific to the Brownwatch use case. Um, we use Solar Prometheus exporter for these lovely dashboards that I made and we have our own tooling for general management. Uh, so this, the reason why we do this is because well, it works for us. Um, this has been done for many, many years and we've been able to keep up with the growth. So when I started five years ago, we only had six clusters, and now we've got over 30. And uh, along the way, we've had to develop many in-house stuff, such as tools to migrate data from cluster to cluster, as well as um, do heavy-duty admin tasks. But it hasn't been all rosy. Um, so scaling hasn't always been our best friend. And um, whilst we have tried to keep on top of it, there's still quite a lot of manual intervention involved. And it's normally me that has to do this, but some new feature will come out in Solar and we'll get really excited, so I investigate it. But it's not until we put it to scale that it doesn't always work out for us as planned. And so this is kind of where the handshake of two things come together. But a backstory to this is in 2018, uh, Brownwatch merged with Crimson Hexagon, which was kind of our biggest competitor. And up until that point, Brand Watch has always been in data centers, whereas Crimson Hexum was always in AWS. And over the last couple of years, with the, the pandemic, the silicone shortage, and the canal blockage, it um, put a massive delay on hardware turnaround for us. So what would be uh, several weeks turned into many months. So it just wasn't scalable for us. And so we made the company decision to prioritize AWS um, instead of data center as this will give us quicker scaling options. And this came about the same time that we were given a new project. So for our quick search, 
um, which had always been a 30-day window at either a 10% or 100% sample set. We were asked to make a 30-month window at a 10% sample set. And so with this, there are some initial thoughts. So we quickly got together and started thinking, well, are we bound to solar? Can we use something else? But for us, we are because, like I mentioned, we have um, our own in-house plugins. And so like the tech debt to not only make something for another service, but also change our whole architecture would be too much. Can we do a direct copy? So effectively, uh, like a lift and shift and just copy what we have already and put it in AWS. But for this, this would be like significantly way more expensive. So that was not an option. But was there anything in AWS that could be used to our advantage so that we um, didn't have to reinvent the wheel or save time? Uh, was there anything we could do with the shard layout or the index sizes that we use that could um, help improve things for when we get on with this project? Uh, but prior to this, we had done um, tests of different permutations when we were building out quick search and found the layout and the number of shards that we have is kind of the most optimal for us. And what kind of infrastructure management could we use? In the past, we had tried using Puppet in AWS, but it didn't really give us um, positive results. And so we didn't really want to do that. But in 2019, uh, I'm severely hunched in the front, but I attended this talk, uh, as did some of my other colleagues. And uh, I can also see Houston, so we're like fangirling. <laughs> um, but after we saw this talk and the success that they had, we definitely knew that we wanted to use this as inspiration for our project. And so you might be asking, well, you're already putting Solar on AWS, which is a new domain for you. Why complicate things by adding Kubernetes on top? Uh, but for us, we saw um, how much Kubernetes could help with just the manual intervention that we would no longer need to do. And so this was a nice benefit for us. So moves on to our planning and design. So of course, we had some goals, which we needed to serve the product requirement. We wanted to have a solar cluster running on Kubernetes and AWS. We wanted close or even better performance to what we were expecting from our clusters in the data center. We wanted scaling to be easy. And we still wanted to support backup and restore for anything um, disaster recovery, touch wood. And we didn't want it to cost the earth because we still needed to get paid. But during this, we had a light bulb idea. So in the past, or up until this point, sorry, uh, our solar clusters um, would receive the same writes and reads to the clusters and they'd be round robined. But we quickly identified that there was duplicate writes going on. So we decided to split this up. So we would have a dedicated write cluster, so to speak, and then we'd ship this data to S3 in like a central area. And this allows us to spin up multiple uh, other solar clusters which can just be responsible for reads. And we found this would be quite a nice idea because then uh, we can spin up clusters as, as and when we go, and we just need to pull the data from S3. We don't need to resync everything up. So we kind of took this idea, and then we started creating really bad drawings. And then we would, as a team, <laughs> go through them and be like, what doesn't work, what does work? And then I upgraded and got an iPad, so then I made nicer drawings. Um, and we went through and see what worked, what didn't work. And we just kind of started building up on this idea and we eventually got somewhere. So I'm going to go through it bit by bit. But we started with the right cluster, because that was going to be the easiest part. We had been building solar clusters for many years. So we um, had some spare hardware in the data center. So we just min-maxed what we had, and it just crammed it in just a couple of instances. And we just leave it alone, because it doesn't have reads. So we don't have to worry about the unpredictability of client queries coming in and killing it. So that was quite easy. Uh, but then getting data into S3 wasn't so easy. Um, so originally, I built a plugin at the point of commit to uh, push this data to S3. And this worked locally and on staging. <clears throat> but then as we scaled up, we encountered lots of block threads and uh, just a cascading uh, set of problems. So we kind of scrapped this, and we kind of leaned back on uh, the quick search product. We only commit every couple of minutes, whereas mentions a lot quicker. So what we've done instead is um, we take a snapshot periodically, and then we upload that data to S3. 
um, and that's worked for us so far. So this is kind of what we have so far, which is the right cluster, and we've got data going into S3. So now we needed to make the read cluster. So this is where the solar operator was our heavenly light. Um, so we deployed this on our Kubernetes cluster, and we got it to spin up a cluster, solar cluster for us, and it kind of just worked for us. It was great. And then we just spun up our other apps that we typically have in a cluster stack. So the Prometheus exporter to give us better visibility, and then the other apps that we use, just such as APIs and stuff, just so we can query the cluster and make sure everything's reachable. So this is all good. We've got a cluster. Um, it's technically a read cluster, even though there's no data in it. So how did we get data from S3 into the cluster? And this is where I introduce the first new component, which is called Argo. So with our version of Solar that we were running, we couldn't ship data from S3 into Solar out of the box. So we built our own application called Argo, which is in Rust. And it's attached as a sidecar container. And essentially, it periodically checks um, a specific path on S3. And once it's seen changes, it will download this locally to the Solar pod update the index.properties file with the new core, reload it, and we've won. But we've built Argo to be safe, so if any problems along the way, we just uh, bail out and carry on using the original core. But more on a deep dive, um, so you can see here we've got our uh, collection and shard in S3 as well as on disk on Solar, and uh, Argo just constantly polls S3 to check if there's anything new. And in the event of uh, a new version coming in to S3, uh, Argo will then get a set of all the segment files that have changed than the previous by getting the set of segments on local and just doing a comparison. And then it creates a new index, downloads these uh, new segments, and then hard links the existing ones. And once the download and sync is complete. We then update the index or properties file to point to the new index. And if that was OK and successful and the uh, replica is being used, we then just get rid of the old one because we don't need it anymore. And by doing this, we've also kind of, for free, got what we call cloud repair. So in the event of a solar pod dropping and we lose all our data, um, Argo is aware of what should be there. So it can recreate the directories for us and then re-download the data for us. So we don't have to do anything. And it's been working pretty well. Um, originally, we were just downloading files as is, and it wasn't that great. So we changed this to use byte ranges, and we kind of forgot about the immutability. So we used that to our advantage. Um, but it's been really efficient and fast for us. So I don't know if you can see it on the slides, but it barely scrapes any CPU and only just over peaks 50% of the memory has been allocated, which isn't even that much. And it downloads quite quickly and keeps our indexes up to date nice and well. And we also discovered recently that we should stop um, Argo prefixing the indexes with what well, Solar prefixes them, so we now have a different name for them. And so this is Argo. Um, and so with that, we now have, oh, we also introduced the cleanup app, which just separates um, S3 from being cleaned up from Argo. So at this point, we had a fully working read cluster. We had it one way replicated, um, one to save costs whilst we were exploring and developing. But also, we kind of thought, well, S3 behind the scenes is uh, replicated. So we're not too scared about um, data going missing. And whilst this served our purpose, we knew that there was a lot more to do. And so this is where I introduce another new component, which we call the Solar Health Daemon. So I don't know for those of you who do use serial clusters, um, but for us, we would have things that would uh, collect data on like the core admin API and the cluster state, and then stitch it together and give us a detailed view. But if a solar node goes down, you can get core timeouts, and then things become slow, and it just gets a pain in the ass. And whilst this, the Prometheus exporter is really great, um, when it is the more complicated problems, um, metric might not always give you the right answer. And so this is where the solar health daemon comes in. So it's also in Rust, because we have some Rust fanatics on our team. 
but um, it can give you a detailed uh, breakdown of each node, but also um, straight away tell you what the status of the cluster is. And the way this works is there's essentially two layers. You've got the judgment layer, which is essentially the cluster state, and then you have your collection layer, which is broken up by multiple monitors. And the key efficiency here is that each monitor is isolated to one particular area of something it needs to monitor. But we start by having watches applied to Zookeeper on the most essential nodes on Zookeeper, which is live nodes and collections. And these monitors um, take this, send it to the cluster state, but then they also create a, with a map um, many, many uh, core admin monitors when it, in the context of the live nodes. And so each one of these monitors then is pointed to a specific solar pod and it will collect the core admin API. And then the state.json is very similar, but the state.json under a collection. And then all of these monitors will um, collect this data and they just constantly send this to the cluster state, which caches this. But in the event of something happening, uh, so say if a solar pod drops offline, obviously the watcher will notify the monitor because um, it's changed. And at this point, the monitor then sends an event to the cluster state where it does a recalculation of the cluster and its health. And it will emit this on its API. And we would get a ping on our phones saying that the cluster is unhealthy. But we've also gone that one step further where we've introduced what we call a circuit breaker. So we put in a Z node in Zookeeper, which our API services constantly check for. And if the circuit breaker is present, it blocks any traffic coming into the cluster. So we can just focus on fixing the cluster if it doesn't do it by itself. And we know that we're not going to be swamped with uh, unwanted requests coming through. And so at a high level, um, it's pretty simple, but you have your client that would um, run queries and then that goes to our gateway. Um, and typically that would be round robining. Um, but then this API instance has detected that there's a circuit breaker. And so it sets its ready status to, to um, can't be used. So the API gateway is aware of this and then won't forward on any traffic. And so this has made it really easy for us to um, see the state of cluster because um, we found, especially when working with Kubernetes, it's not always easy to debug things. Um, multiple times we've had to just spin up a busy box just to check things. Um, so this has been really nice for us. So you can see there that um, straight away it's just telling you what um, is wrong with certain nodes, etc. And it's just been a really nice feature for us. And if a cluster is sick and becomes healthy again, then the daemon removes the circuit breaker so the cluster can serve requests again. And so that's our solar health daemon. And then finally, we have what we call the Hera manager. Um, so pre-context, this project was called Hera, which is why that's called that. But this is just a lightweight application to um, allow people to do uh, schema and config um, deployments, because it's not just our team that can do them. And if in the event that is unbalanced, we can run balance operations, which will do that. And this is our end result. This is what a read cluster looks like to us. And it serves us pretty well. And you might be um, ready to heckle me, but um, and have some questions. So a key one would be, why aren't you using Java that much, or the serial library? Um, one of the reasons is when we were originally sitting down and planning things and doing our research, we couldn't really see much material out there of people doing similar work and writing about it. So kind of limited what we could learn from. And so on the flip side, we had the freedom of being creative. Um, the plugin that we originally had to upload data just caused too many issues. And we kind of on a deadline. So we decided to just scrap it and stick with what we know. Our team aren't actually Java developers either. Um, we look at other fun languages such as Rust. Um, and we have also found that it does prevent many race conditions when dealing with asynchronous and threaded code, which we were doing a lot of in this case. But we have our cluster, and now we obviously need to test things. So we um, obviously didn't have anything in AWS before in our team. And so we had to see what would work. Uh, originally, there wasn't any like-for-like -like machine, and so we would um, we compiled a spreadsheet, got all the instances, and tried many different configurations, and then we did uh, different types of tests, which would be a single user, um, incremental, and a pure throttling the cluster, 
and we used Locust, and then we started collecting results, and they were really crap, and so we thought this would be a dead end. Um, but some of the improvements that I've already mentioned, we applied along the way, which gave us better results, and we found the Graviton chips, which made a significant difference as well. And this allowed us to filter out which would work, which wouldn't. But we also know that this couldn't be a definitive answer, because effectively we were doing uh, a simulation. So we needed to do something else. So we um, applied what we call shadow loading. Um, so we had, um, <coughs> when we found an instance that we thought would work, we'd spin up a cluster to scale, and then uh, we would shadow load any traffic going to a real cluster and just point it to this one so we could see what it would look like in a real life scenario. And this, for us, was kind of like the final test. And with that, we then managed to find something that would actually work for us. So on the right there is an example of the product of we, one of the products that we sell, um, and it runs on just 64 AWS instances uh, instead of 192 that we typically use, and we're quite close to performance. For some reason, this gift way slower than the actual real life, I do promise you that. Um, things to do with whatever website I used last night. Um, but what did we learn along the way? The solar operator does make running a cluster on Kubernetes easy, and we can't recommend it enough. Um, the opportunity to shadow load real life traffic is really going to be what differentiates between uh, something that's going to be feasible and something that's not. Uh, we've made Argo work with solar replication, so we've now scaled up, and this gives us much better performance, which we kind of expected anyway, but at the time we didn't really have the budget. Um, the scaling from AWS does allow us to be more flexible, so we don't have to wait several months to get more boxes. We can just do a one line PR. And downloading in byte ranges is also a good improvement. But also, don't be afraid to think outside the box. I think it's um, fair to say we did that in this case, and it's paid off for us. And finally, uh, what's planned next for us? So we want to upgrade solar, obviously, um, hopefully to version 9, because uh, there's the incremental backup and restores that could probably help us a lot but also the S3 support that came in 8.10. And then we just some other features that we're quite excited about, so open tracing makes um, diagnostics a bit easier. We might investigate uh, Topo LVM, which allows you to run multiple solar instances on one given AWS instance. And we need to really move the right cluster into AWS as well. And we're looking at uh, open sourcing some of our applications, like the Solar Health Demon, if there is interest. Um, and that's kind of it, really. Uh, we're hiring, and um, thank you for coming. And if we've got time, there'll be some questions. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Uh, so uh, once again, we have uh, the chance, or you have the chance, to uh, ask some questions. But before um, uh, lifting something up, like the hand, and, yes, I see. Uh, and then I come by and uh, so that the people online can hear everything. Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much for your awesome talk. Um, on one slide, you, you presented the uh, kind of architecture that you put up on AWS on the read side. You kind of rushed over it saying, uh, okay, and then we put our read cluster on Kubernetes and... Um, no, no, the more in-depth uh, slide, but um, the, the point is um, here's Solar and there's Zookeeper and it just works and you rush to the next slide. Could you elaborate a bit more on how you oh. put Solar and Zookeeper in, in play on AWS? Because that is what, what uh, we at our company found a uh, most interesting problem, to say it in a nice way, um, to get Solar and, and um, Zookeeper play together in a, in a meaningful and scalable way. Yeah, uh, are you using the solar operator? No. Uh, I recommend using the solar operator. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just does it all for you. Okay. Um, yeah, that made our life a lot easier. Okay, thank you. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, one, so... 
Um, I also evangelize the solar operator, unsurprisingly. Um, and I generally kind of talk about how it's easier to kind of scale to more nodes and have smaller nodes that aren't handling a ton of cores, but it seems like you've actually scaled from more like solar processes on bare metal to less solar processes in Kubernetes. That was very interesting on, I, I just want to know how you found that and like if you're actually storing more data on each node um, now that you're on Kubernetes. Um, I believe we are storing more data on each node um, and we don't have the data center on bare metal still outperforming, and we think that's because the more nodes there are, there's more shared pooling of resources. Yeah. Um, but we've managed to scale down enough that we can get almost uh, similar results. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you for that. I have one other question. So since you're kind of pulling S3 data all the time, are you using persistent data on Kubernetes, or are you just letting the ephemeral data go away and sync it back whenever it comes back up? Um, I think, are we? We are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, I thought we were. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're using, um, I forgot what it's called now. But yes, we are. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah, so congratulations on the talk and the massive scale. Um, I'm interested on in knowing how S3 comes into play when it comes to replication and how that uh, compares with basic replication capabilities that Solar has. Or if you were able, guys, to, to check other possibilities apart from like replication from Solar, or how, which was the roadmap which led you to S3 to replicate? Yeah. Um, so there was the possibility of cross data center replication, I think that's what it's called. Um, but then seeing that that was going to get deprecated, we thought there's no point trying to use it. Um, but um, this also, the setup we've used makes um, it more scalable. So say if in the context we want to upgrade Solo, we can just spin up another cluster with this data from S3 and then re-index that whilst we're still serving and then we can then do the switch. So it just becomes, it's like decoupling for us. Ah, uh, okay. Thanks for the talk. Uh, one question that I have is uh, whether you, what sort of replica types you were using, and whether you evaluated uh, Solar's pool replicas instead of uh, this way to move data across. Yeah. Um, so I this was a very like over a year ago, but I originally tried spinning up a collection with just pool-based replicas, but it didn't work because obviously it needs to have a leader. Um, so we just used Tlog. Um, in our mentions platform, we use NRT because it needs to be quite real time. But yeah, T logs helped us um, be quite more efficient as well. Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> um, hello, hi. I'm just curious to know uh, how frequently is the data updated? So, like queries per minute or something like that. And the second question is so you separated out reads and writes. Uh, how frequently is the S3 data synced with the you know read instances of Solar? Um, the sync one, I think I can tell you. Uh, no, I can't. Um, so the <laughs> great, um, we commit uh, every couple of minutes, but we upload maybe uh, for each uh, like index, maybe every 10, 15 minutes, and then the download um, only takes up to a minute, but that would be whenever the upload's finished, so around every every 10, 15 minutes as well. So, um, one, uh, thank you, uh, Richard, it was great. So this is for him. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>